start recording? Yeah, right now, just I started. Oh, okay, perfect. So I think since we have a pretty packed agenda, um, we'll start. Um, there is an etherpad. Um, I post the... Um, I post the URL in the uh, in the chat. Uh, please go there and put your name and affiliation on it. That's uh, the blue the blue, uh, blue sheet. Um, we also have a note taker, Richard. Volunteered, um, sort of. Um, thank you for that. Um, really appreciate it. Um, if anyone else um, wants to. Um, correct things or so, Etherpad is a shared thing. Uh, especially people in the discussion go there and correct your names. Um, next slide. This is the note well. well. This is a ITF working group meeting, so it's covered by note well. Next slide. Um, kind of logistics. So if you're hearing us, the WebEx link is not interested anymore. The Etherpad link is there. Um, there's a Jabber room, I think. Um, we will use the WebEx chat for queue management. So if you want to uh, discuss something, uh, say something, please put a queue plus, please put a queue plus on, on the chat. Um, if you want to get dequeued, Q minus. Please state your name um, and make sure that um, it's also correct in the um, in the notes, uh, since sometimes it's hard to understand you. Um, if you want to submit internet drafts, which are in, which you want the working group to um, pay attention to, um, put TCPM in the draft name and you'll find it. Next slide. So this is the agenda of today. We are in the way, uh, working group status updates. Then we have a couple of presentations for working group documents. Um, we have um, um, RTO considerations from Mark, uh, 793 BIS from, I think it's Michael Scharf giving the presentation. Michael Weiss will talk about RFC 2140 BIS. Uh, then we have two talks about accurate ECN, one from Bob, about uh, the, the draft and one from Ilpo about the Linux implementation. And then we have a TCP rec presentation from Yu Chang covering um, the um, results of the uh, working group last call. And then we have for other presentations for non-working group items, the Yang model for TCP. Um, we have been running a um, call for redemption on the mailing list. Uh, high start from Praveen. Um, and then two things which are related to um, egg handling in TCP. Um, one is about requesting eggs, one is about reducing the rate. Um, these are the last two presentations. Next slide. Uh, we have two changes. I want to uh, make sure you're aware of them. One is uh, the, TCP, the MP TCP working group has been closed. And um, the maintenance of these documents is uh, happening in this doc is happening in this working group. So uh, the charter has been extended by the sentence I, which is written on the slide, which means um, MPTCP maintenance is in this working group. And the responsible ID has changed. Um, Martin is now in charge. Next slide. Uh, that's simple. No recent ROCs. Next slide. Um, the working group documents, we have one which is in the RFC editor queue, that's the TCP, uh, the, the TCP converters draft. Um, we have REC and RTO considerations uh, where we have been running a working group last call. Um, and we also have presentations on them to see what the outcome was. Um, we have three, three more working group documents which are uh, shown in blue where we have presentations on it uh, today. And then uh, the generalized ECN, which hasn't been, uh, there's no presentation on it, and the TCP EDO, 
which is uh, even, I think we don't have a current, docu uh, current active document on that. Um, these documents here are listed in the, in the order of uh, the milestones. So we are um, right now working from top to bottom. Um, Regarding the, the the ones where the working group last call hasn't ended, it doesn't mean that the working group last call show up in this particular order. We will make that dependent on the state of the document. Um, I think that was the last slide. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I forgot is um, we have three co-chairs, Yoshi, um, who is running the, uh, the presentations right now, um, Michael Scharf, who's also on the call, and myself. And I'm doing the moderation today since uh, Michael is involved in some of the documents. Okay, Bob wants to say something. No, I just wanted to ask, um, how would you like us to chat? On the WebEx chat or on the Jabber chat? Uh, is there someone on the Jabber room? Then I think. Well, yes, I'm on the Jabber room. Okay, so, so then do the, do the stuff on the Jabber room and use the um, use the WebEx chat for the queue management. I think this is this was done at the uh, TSV WG meeting also, and I think it worked. Yeah, you, you, I, I'm sort of hinting that you might want to explain to people how to do the plus queue and all that sort of thing for people who have done I this before. Yeah, told them that we use the WebEx chat for if you want to say something, say plus queue. Yep. If you want to go off the queue, minus queue. You can also use but, but, you can use infix and postfix operators. Right. Uh, it, it was mainly that um, I don't think the transcript is kept for the WebEx, so any anything you want in the transcript is on the Java. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so then I'm done with that part, and it's time for Mark. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay, Mike, I give you a ball. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, fine. somebody open up slides, right? Can you share your slide? Can I what? Yeah. Can you share your slide? You can now. You have your presenter, so you can share your slide. Yeah, I thought you or she was going to do it. Um. Oh, okay. I see. Uh, That's what I was hoping for and waiting on. Oh, sorry. Then I will be a presenter, and then I will share. Okay. Aha. There we go. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's do this real quick. Uh, this is the old RTO consider document. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, this has been around forever. Um, I looked it up about nine years. Um, so just the sort of very brief tour of what the document is. Um, we sort of thought we understood RTOs well enough. Um, to get away from sort of the nitty gritty specifics and move sort of more to uh, general requirements and guidelines. And so we started that uh, a long time ago and you can go to the next slide. Um, this is a specific example of what I'm talking about. So instead of sort of an algorithm like this, so a very specific um, equation, we can get to sort of requirements. An RTO should be based on a set of round trip times and the variance of the round trip time, things like that, okay? Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, we have, I don't know, six, seven, eight of these big picture guidelines in the document. And my take is that we've had consensus on these for about, about nine years. Um, there's really never been um, 
much beyond sort of tweaking of these things over the whole nine years. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, and the reason we haven't gotten this document done is that we've struggled with the positioning of this document in the sort of context of the rest of the RFCs that are already there. Okay, so we're trying to put some requirements, some guidelines sort of on top of an existing body of documents. This is proven to be um, difficult. Okay, so I would go out and try one approach and, and make somebody happy and then put out a new version and somebody else would be unhappy with that positioning. And so you see that this sort of, we have these active periods and inactive periods over the last nine years. Um, the, the, the sort of blue circles there where I'm trying really hard to find some way to frame the context. Um, it makes everybody at least roughly happy. And then the sort of red areas are where I've thrown up my hands and just decided that I, I don't know what I don't know what the hell to do. So go to the next slide. Um, so around IETF 106, um, we got a couple good reviews into uh, about this document. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Gory's review. And Gory had a bunch of Sort of smallish comments that, that were addressed, but his big his big about the document was that it didn't explicitly state a position relative to the other RFC. And Gory and I exchanged a bunch of email, and we talked, and um, ultimately I reworked section two in the document. And I want to tell you how. Um, I don't want to put words in Gory's mouth. I see him. I see him there in the list. Um, so he can speak for himself. But I believe that these have addressed his concern. So. Uh, let me go through the three bullets that we added. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, the first one explicitly says the document does not update or obsolete any existing RFC. So the RFCs that exist now, they have their um, they have their own consensus, and this document does not change that. Okay. Um, for the most part, this document is consistent with all the previous RFCs. Not for the letter, but you know, we used all of our previous knowledge to sort of arrive at these requirements and guidelines. So it, it's pretty consistent. Um, but this does not change anything that's already committed to RFC. Uh, so next bullet. So this is for uh, the document is really meant to sort of to, to look to the future and provide what I think of as sort of a default for how we handle RTOs going forward. Um, and so we say that the guidelines in the document should be used, capital should be used sort of in the future. Okay, and then we got uh, the next slide, which is the third bullet, which says, okay, that last bullet's a sh should, not a must. Okay, it's fine to deviate from these requirements. If you have a good reason, that's fine. It's a default position. Um, you can deviate. Right? But if you deviate, then you must A, explain why you're deviating, and B, you have to go through the usual process and gather consensus on, on those deviations. Okay? I think that's all pretty reasonable. Um, so those are the sort of changes in response to Gory's comments. If you go to the next slide, we'll look at Jonna's comments. Um, again, he, he sent a, a review in around ITF 106, although He's really been sort of in my ear about this for, for a couple of years now. And his, his comment is basically, why is this document centered around retransmission? And it's really about loss, re loss detection, okay? Um, sort of find loss and, and sort of who cares if the action we take is to retransmit the segment, not retransmit the segment, uh, transmit some updated, uh, updated information so it's not a, you know, bit for bit retransmit. Um, why is the document framed about retransmissions when it really is about loss detection? And if we just framed it differently, then it would be sort of more useful. And so the latest revision centers around loss detection, talks about things in terms of loss detection. So that made the uh, really ugly in the last version because we uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 
because lots of the words changed here and there from retransmission to loss detection, but the the requirements and, and whatnot, the technical need didn't change at all. So uh, next slide. Um, so uh, as, as was noted in, in the opening, um, we've just sort of made it to the working group last call. Um, there was a minor suggestion about um, one of the requirements. Uh, it was a issue of uh, just an issue of wording um, that will be fixed. Uh, it's not a big deal. Um, but there were no big other big comments. There were really no other comments except for that one. So uh, next slide. So uh, I think the chairs just uh, wanted me to say, you know, a few words and, and take any other comments that folks have here. Um, you know, I'm happy with the document. I think we could forward it on, um, but it's not my call. So, so you really all. So you said that there is minor minor changes. So you will um, submit a new revision, including that. Yeah. So um, the minor change there was this sort of a problem, a little problem when I went from the retransmission language to the loss detection language. Um, that uh, I can't even remember who flagged it. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I should remember that. Um, but. It was, it was just a little problem with that, and I will fix that um, and submit a, a version 11. Perfect. Any other comments? Going once, twice. Okay, then. So, uh, so what's that mean? Do we? That means you submit a new version, and yep. Th then I would consider it that the working group last calls have been addressed. Great. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Which means the next presentation is about RFC 793 bis, and um, is Wes in the call or is? Michael doing the presentation. I don't see Wes in the list of participants. So then I would say Michael is doing it. Yes, that's my assumption. Unless somebody masks himself with Wes. Um, so I'd like to give um, a quick update on 793 bis. Um, basically in my role as potential document shepherd. So Wes has recently uh, published a summary of the remaining open issues on the list. Uh, the link is on the slide. And some of the uh, key remaining things that Wes is aware of are summarized on uh, the slide here. So the first one is about um, the, um, how to handle the reserved bits in the header. Um, most notably whether um, to change the ANA allocation for that. Um, there's room for cleaning up the registry um, a bit. There's been some discussion on that on the list already, so it's mostly me and Joe who have uh, commented on that. Um, I think so far there's been no pushback, um, have consensus at least among me and Joe, and probably also Wes. So um, I assume that if nobody else speaks up, Wes will uh, implement what has been discussed so far on the list. But of course, you feel free to look at that discussion. Please feel free to comment. Um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, Wes will probably still wait for some few uh, weeks uh, for further discussion, and then he will um, uh, publish another version. Uh, the second topic that has been discussed is um, about uh, a certain text on R1 and R2 values. Uh, these are thresholds. Um, and there were, I think in the, in the review from Corey, there was some questions on whether that's really implemented or not. Um, I, ha I have checked that at least I think the Linux stack does something reasonably similar to what uh, uh, is written in the RC. So to me, at least this, this looks good. Uh, there's no need to change from my perspective, but again, maybe others should look at that. 
Uh, then, uh, third thing, uh, third topic is that, uh, get, uh, that gateway detection, uh, that is about cross-layer interaction. Again, Joe has commented on that, um, and I think the current status is that there's no plan to change the document. Uh, and finally, there has been some discussion on, I think, the listen API call, and that's described in, in 793BIS. And I think Wes will implement uh, the wording suggested by Joe, uh, unless somebody else speaks up. And that's it for the moment. So I strongly suggest to the rest of the group, please have a look at these four issues. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, please speak up on the mailing list so that we can sort that out. And in general, um, the plan, as you've probably seen this before, that uh, if this document uh, doesn't get further comments, we will, of course, start thinking about the working group last call. And I see that Mirja is, uh, uh, wants to comment, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I, I lost the ball a little bit, but we discussed last time quite extensively to change the registration um, policy for the header bits. And uh, at the time, the discussion was about how urgent that might be or not. It's not that urgent anymore, but there was also a proposal if that should be integrated into this, uh, this document. Yes, but well, there, there are two different things. So uh, I think you have been, uh, it was in your document, you have suggested that there's, um, it makes sense to clean up the registry. Uh, first of all, because the uh, the header bits are documented on a separate page, first of all, and then uh, some of the reserved header bits don't have even an entry. Um, and at the moment, the proposal is in 793 bis um, to basically clean up the registry, uh, to move everything to one page, and to mm -hmm. the, um, the the reserved bits that are um, at the moment not in the table. The allocation policy will not be changed by 793 bis. Um, so that is probably entirely out of scope of 793 bis because it would require a separate proposed standard uh, with community consensus on changing the allocation policy. So this is only about um, basically editorial changes to the IANA registry. It doesn't change anything. Uh, uh, regarding how to allocate bits, uh, uh, things like that, because that would most likely um, have to be discussed separately in a separate proposed standard document. In general, 793 bits only reflects changes to TCP that are already documented on standard track. I mean, I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, but I think that's a decision for the group to make. I mean, like, if we have a BIS document, we can decide to change everything if it's reasonable, right? So we could have a discussion if we want to do the update of the policy within this document or in a separate document. For me, both is okay. I just wanted to check what the group wants. Well, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, I agree it's a valid discussion to have from my perspective. Uh, also, as chair, the scope of this document has been very clear from the beginning, uh, the document only implements changes on standards track. So we can, of course, change that, but uh, changing this, that would first be a scope of the document. And I would personally just suggest not to go down that road, but of course, we can have this discussion. But as I said, what is at the moment, I think, uh, agreed between everyone, everyone who has commented is that we will clean up uh, the DNA registry because there uh, have been, uh, it's not perfect, the current status is not perfect. Uh, we will move one table, uh, 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 create a new table and move it to the uh, other uh, TCP parameter. So that's the suggestion at the moment. But as I said, I mean, this is open for discussion. It hasn't received a lot of feedback. Um, every four points uh, could deserve further um, feedback on the list. So. Please feel free to continue the discussion on the mailing list if you have any thoughts on these four points. Okay, thank you. I think uh, at least cleaning up the registry is very, very good, so I can go ahead and update my document, take this out, and then bring it back yes. to the group. Yes, so I think uh, that is, I mean, I think uh, there, there has been a discussion before on cleaning up the registry. So, so I recall that um, uh, it has been discussed on the list before. So yep. there seems to be consensus that that's a good thing to do. And that, that's just editorial. It doesn't change anything from a standard perspective. So the proposal is to do that in 793 bis. 
And if you want to uh, change the allocation policy, I mean, that is probably a separate discussion. At least I would just suggest to keep that out of 793 bis for the moment. Okay. Any other questions? If that's not the case, then thank you very much, Michael. And um, we are going to RFC for, uh, 2140 bis, which is also Michael. Also, in this case, um, you have five minutes. Oh, <laughs> um, okay, yeah, well, uh, five minutes, one title slide and one more slide. <laughs> the title slide Including the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's how we look, yes, well, um, can you go to the next piece? All right, so what really happened is that we had this version one, which uh, didn't get much feedback, but then at some point got a pretty long and very thorough review from Michael Schaaf that we incorporated. It took us some time, but we incorporated it all and answered everything. It was extremely helpful. There was, uh, it was just about texting, so there wasn't any, any real technical issue as far as I remember that, that would have been a problem, but uh, some reorganization necessary, some stuff making the text just more readable and easier to understand. So that's the reorganization and more clear discussion that you see mentioned on the slide here. Uh, section 6.3 is new. There is more text explaining things a bit better. There is quite a bit of reformatting. Uh, tables have been moved around and typos have been corrected. Security considerations now talk about fingerprinting. There is Appendix B that uh, mentions um, all the TCP options in the world. <laughs> and talks about uh, whether you would like to share them or not, or like share, uh, share something, cache something about them or not. And uh, that was originally meant just for us as something to remember and look at, um, but we, de we decided that this could actually stay. We rephrased, we rephrased things a little bit to be a bit more formal in style. Um, the references were reorganized and that's it. It would be great people would read it and it would be even greater if we could move on with that document to so whatever you think the chairs think is appropriate. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Um, questions, comments, suggestions? So then, if I understand that right, ah, Mia wants to say something. I know, it's, it's an old Q+. Um, so if I understand the authors correctly, you are done with the document. Yes. OK. So then this is a candidate for a working group last call from your perspective. Yes. OK. So then the chair. <laughs> Maybe I should add, um, um, I tried to get at least one review for this document, and we have a reviewer who has committed to review it, but he hasn't done so far. So I will ping him again. Uh, um, I've tried it already uh, more than once, but um, I hope that we will get another review relatively soon uh, so that we have at least one other review. Um, but of course, if, if that doesn't work out, we have to start thinking about moving to another uh, Google Glass call. Uh, you know. Yeah, so I think that pretty much describes this situation from the church perspective. If, if we can get another review soon, we would like to have it. Um, if not, then this is a candidate for um, a working group last call. Okay, if there are none common, no comments, no questions, then thank you very much, Michael. And um, we go forward with Bob on accurate ECM feedback. Um, Bob, you have 15 minutes, including discussion. Yep. And um, people on this call, please go to the bl uh, blue sheet. Uh, so put your name on the blue sheet. It's on the Etherpad. Yep. And I'm expecting you to put the slides up. Yep. Okay. Um, there's the draft name, and I'm going to cover two drafts since the last. Um, uh, update I gave on this, which was November last year. So next slide. 
Um, all right, just a very quick recap. Um, accurate ECN is a way to get more than one congestion signal per round trip time out of um, the TCP wire protocol. It's a change to the wire protocol um, because the, the, the previous way of doing it um, essentially turned a toggle on which stayed on for the whole round trip time. And so you could only get one per round trip time. And um, it involved before two, two flags in the TCP header. Next slide. Um, we're moving to um, three flags that are used for um, the original negotiation at the start in the, during the handshake, but then they get overloaded as a three bit counter. And there's also a um, accurate ECN option. Next. And the accurate ECN option, I should add, is um, supplementary information, which is not essential for the working of the protocol, but you don't get the full accuracy without it. All right. Um, a brief update on the um, activity since November. From draft 9 to 10, um, or there, there was a large number of what we might call minor technical changes, tweaks, etc. cetera. Um, large amount of them due to ILPO's implementation, which he's going to present straight after this. So I'm not going to dwell too much on some of those things other than give a bit of introductory and, and high level overview um, to help people orient. Um, and a uh, huge thanks to Olivia, uh, to Ilpo, whose implementation, I should say, was based on LVAs and MIAs, um, for going into it in such depth. It's been a great help. Um, and, and the draft is now much improved because of that. Um, and there's also quite a bit from other list discussions that you'll notice. Those six main areas um, I, are the headings of the next six slides, so I'm not going to list those here um, uh, in verbally. And then from draft 10 to 11, um, there was a change from experimental track to standards track. And I, I tried to separate out those two changes so that it was absolutely obvious which um, deltas were which. Thanks. Next slide. So the first of those technical um, points, number one of six, when I was doing the um, uh, looking looking at making this into a update to 3168 as a standards track um, document instead of an experimental, um, I went through the whole of 3168 and checked that um, it, it would cover everything and, and be a um, sort of first class replacement and realized that there was one section of 3168 that wasn't covered, which was essentially your rights and obligations about using ECN once you've negotiated accurate ECN rather than the original 3168 feedback mode. And I'm not going to list all these, uh, talk about all these things here because they're all motherhood and apple pie. They're basically saying you can set ECT, but you don't have to. You have to respond to congestion, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they're all in the draft. Please go review them. This is just a heads up that they are all there. Next. Right. I want to go into this one in a bit more depth. Um, the backwards compatibility negotiation um, that's done during the handshake has been in accurate ECN since right at the start. It's very similar to the one in 3168, which, if you like, was backwards compatible with not having ECN. And there's now sort of three levels, which you can see in this little diagram on the right hand side, um, where if you're an accurate ECN client, you offer accurate ECN and whatever sort of server um, you hit will either accept accurate ECN or if it's a um, 3168 server, it will give you um, uh, accept ECN back. And if it's neither, it will give you non-ECN back. Um, and there's um, so essentially you get the, the highest version um, that both ends can support in, in one round, an obvious sort of capability negotiation. Now, um, if for some reason your packets aren't getting through, um, there is a recommendation to keep trying once more and then then fall back to um, asking for not ECN. Um, and the little red brackets in the diagram, the little pr red parentheses and the um, strike through at the bottom of the little diagram are um, pointed out in the bullets essentially 
the parentheses say that the server doesn't actually have to implement 3168 ECN um, because um, that, that's not necessary for the negotiation. Obviously, it, it's up to the implementer whether they do. Um, and there's no, no particular reason why they shouldn't, but they don't have to. The crossed out or ECN on the um, sort of fallback at the bottom there says that if you fall back from asking for accurate ECM because you're not getting through for some reason, maybe the bits in the header get blocked by a middle box or something like that, then um, you can fall back to not having ECN at all, but you can't fall back from accurate ECN to just ECN. And this is the same in the other direction um, for the SYNAC. If you've already said you can do accurate ECN, you can only fall back to no ECN at all. And this is just because um, otherwise the number of possible combinations of sins and um, sins that are asking for different things that may get reordered um, and may some may get lost I mean the number of possible combinations of states you may be in gets ridiculous so it's just easier to keep it to two <coughs> um, for the for the small number of times where this might happen um, so I'd appreciate people reviewing whether they believe that is a good good decision. I mean, we could make it even more complicated, but I don't want to. Um, and uh, so that's that's essentially what that um, bullet says there. Uh, the, the first two bullets say. Then the third main bullet says that um, when you do retransmit your SIN and fall back to non-ECN, you should use the same ISN. And this is to prevent a downgrade attack um, where someone else could copy your um, IS, um, ISN um, and, and get in. Or, or, sorry, someone else could just generate a random ISN. And this allows the other end to um, notice that it's not the same ISN um, and therefore kick them out. And finally, um, there was just a uh, point in the text where we still ha we're talking about the nonce um, and we've now reserved that rather than it being for the nonce because the nonce is now historic. So that's that one next. Right. Um, so the next one is is going to be covered a lot by Ilpo in Ilpo's talk. So I just want to give some background to that. And essentially, this, this is the background slide to my next slide, where mangling detection is done only on the handshake. So the only time one end gets to see a reflection of what they sent is in the three-way handshake. And I've tried to draw it with a little red and yellow colors and the diagram on the left, where the ECN field that's sent by the client in the IP header gets reflected back in the um, SYNAC in the TCP header. And similarly, the IP ECN field that's um, sent in the um, SYNAC uh, uh, under the SYNAC gets reflected back in the TCP header of the ACK. Right? So, um, and, and the two tables taken from the draft show the same encoding is used to encode the four states of the ECN field in the TCP header to give that feedback. So ne next slide. So that's the how the, how the protocol is meant to work. Um, and we've just tweaked some of those things. Firstly, the first bullet um, says that um, you only reflect the IP ECN field of the SYNAC on the ACK of the SYNAC. Uh, whereas before, in, a, in uh, draft eight uh, and before, we said you also repeated it in the first data packet. And um, Ilpo will talk about this, but it, it got really complicated um, to define what the first data packet was and whether there was one. And there was all, all sorts of problems with GPACs and things. Um, then the second point here is that we the reason we were trying to um, repeat that field was because the third act is not reliably delivered. So we were not not getting reliable delivery of this mangling detection. Now, um, 
having removed that, we no longer have reliable delivery of mangling detection, but what we have done is made sure we at least get reliable delivery of the congestion notification. So if there's CE on the SYNAC, we get reliable delivery of that because of the um, arrangement for showing that in the counter of CEs that start coming on the data afterwards. So um, it does um, get through on the packets after the ACK, um, but again, I'd like people to um, comment or review the decision not to have full mangling detection if that ACK gets lost. So then you would not, or the server would not know whether its um, IP uh, ECN field was getting mangled um, on those connections where the app gets lost in the other direction. Yeah, can I interrupt you for one thing? Uh, yep. So it it would not know if it doesn't have the option, right? If it does have the option, it can still detect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there are there are a number of other um, things you can do. One of which um, I've, I've actually um, it was advised by a couple of people. I, I know Apple do this. Um, where if, if they're getting CE continually, they um, turn off ECN on the basis that it's um, probably mangling. Um, and I can put a recommendation to do that in the draft as well. I, I, I would like to. Um, right. And the third point I will leave for Ilpo to talk about um, because he's probably got more time than me to do it. Next. Right. So the third area where there was a minor change. Um, we have this three-bit field I mentioned as a counter of the number of ECN marks arriving at the data receiver that it feeds back to the data sender. And of course, with only three bits, that wraps quite frequently. It can do. And um, we had a statement in the draft that um, it should conservatively assume that it wrapped more than once if it could have done based on the ACK number. So if the ACK number looks like you've, you you could have had um, enough ACKs for that to counter to wrap, um, and maybe they've all got thinned out or lost, um, previously it had to assume that the uh, field did wrap, but that ended up giving really quite poor performance in quite a lot of cases, um, assuming that um, you'd got nine CE marks instead of one. And so uh, we've changed that text to the safest likely case, which is a bit um, uh, sort of undefined way of saying um, do your best, um, whereas conservative um, was just too, too poor. And there's an example algorithm of how to do that in the appendix, which um, works reasonably well. Next. Um, so um, now moving on to the optional accurate ECN option. Um, in the last um, working group discussions, there will be introduced this idea of, um, I think for originally it was Neil Cardwell asked if we could um, make the order of the fields a bit more optimal for, for certain cases. So we int introduced two possible orders for the fields and a um, way of indicating on the first um, occurrence of those fields which order you were using. Um, there was general consensus on that, but then Michael um, strongly disagreed with it on the list. So I haven't changed it yet. Um, but I'm quite open to changing it. And there are two alternatives, one being using two option kinds, which Michael has pointed out um, is not a sparse um, or a, is not a uh, scarce resource. And um, the other option would be to add a flag spike, which Ilpo is proposing. Um, I'm not overly um, in agreement with with that solution. Um, partly because I don't think the um, field that is in the flags byte at the moment is necessary. 
And so then we'd have a flag spike that only did one thing. And we could do that with two option kinds. But if we do have a flag spike, um, if other people disagree with me, then I would certainly agree with putting the field order into that. Um, uh, but of course, we have very limited space in TCP options, so any any individual byte is um, something we have to be very careful about. Right, and we have added more robustness in the rules concerning when you send an accurate ECN option. Um, and I'm not sure Ilpo goes through this. Um, perhaps Ilpo can interject if he is going to say all this, then I don't need to go down this list. but. Um, you have two minutes, including this. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll jump over it, assuming Ilpo can talk about this. Next. Um, right. Just a, a corner case, things like um, in Windows SYN during time wait. Um, uh, Ilpo found all those things when he was doing his testing. Next. Um, so we've done some editorial changes, um, rationalized the structure because this draft has been going on, going on for quite a long time, so it's got in somewhat of a mess. Um, and um, Ilpo pointed out that some of the main sort of extremely obvious behaviors didn't actually have any normative text, so we added that um, and added some text about what acceptable packets were and made that all explicit. Um, next. And the other, the other stuff there is not... Um, important editorial stuff. So now this is the, the switch from um, draft 10 to draft 11, um, which was from experimental standards track. There's just one slide on this. So we caught all mentions of experiment throughout the draft and um, made it not talk about experiments, removed the experimental goals section, and um, added a complete new section, giving all the updates to RFC 3168, which were quite um, uh, organized in that you know, this table here shows the mapping from one to the other. You've got a whole section or subsection in 3168 on TCP initialization, which maps directly to negotiating the use of accurate ECN. You've got a whole section on the TCP sender in 3168, which we don't change hardly because this is about feedback. It's, it's mainly about the receiver end, um, except Obviously, where it talks about responding to count, um, re responding to ECE, we talk about, or accurate ECN talks about responding to counters instead, and um, the sender no longer sets CWR to say it's reduced its congestion window. Um, so then the TCP receiver was where all the changes are, and that maps to um, section 3.2 of the accurate ECN draft, which is the huge section in in the accurate ECN draft that talks about all the ways that feedback's done. And it's 3.2 has got sub, sub, subsections, you know, so um, it's a very big section. 615, um, there was a little bit about acceptable retransmission packets um, and, and how to test for them in, in 3168. And we, as I just mentioned, have now um, included acceptable packet tests um, or more explicitly in accurate ECN for all packets, not just retransmissions. And finally, um, there are a number of sections um, that prohibit the use of ECT on control packets and retransmissions. Now, the accurate ECN draft doesn't change any of that. It doesn't change any of those requirements, but what it does do is define the feedback if you get one of those packets anyway. And that allows um, things to change in future, and it should have been in 3160 anyway to say, even though we're saying don't do this, if you get a packet like this, what do you do? Um, it should have been in there. Um, and it's now in, well, it's been in Accurate ECN for a long time. Okay, but there's the mapping there. Next, I think we're on the last slide. Oh no, there's one more question, yes. The, um, the mangling detection, there was, um, a question that you may want to consider that if it becomes a non-problem longer term, there is a bit of um, complexity in accurate ECN dealing with mangling and detection. And we did think, how could we remove all that in the future? It wouldn't actually be at all easy. Um, it would require quite a long, drawn-out two-stage process. But the, um, you can read this slide if you want to think about that. And finally, the last slide. 
um, just to say um, Ilpo's full implementation in Linux um, is a, a patch in 28 sequence parts. He's um, submitted it for upstreaming as a, as a request for comments, and it's on hold pending the EC1 decision in, in um, the Linux community as well as in the ITF at the moment. And um, it's also, uh, Accurate ESIN has also been implemented without the TCP option in FreeBSD, but the Linux one has, is the full spec. It's every little piece of it. Um, and as I've said, we're um, we're ready for working group last call, um, but I think the chairs want to wait for the ECD1 decision from TSVWG before they do, even though Accurate ESIN theoretically is independent of that, but um, I think it, I can understand why they want to wait. And similarly, generalized ECN is dependent on accurate ECN. It's a, um, a normative reference, so um, that will have to sit in the same holding stack. Thanks, Paul. Please be sure to get I think Mia was first. Yeah, um, hi, um, thank you for all the work you did, you did most of the work here. Um, looking at this text again, I have two minor points. One is about the uh, ECN or ACE rep um, behavior. And I realized that there can also be a case where the counter actually doesn't change, but you have received enough X that it could have wrapped once, but to exactly the same value again, right? Mm -hmm. And then if, in this case, if you assume it didn't wrap, then you didn't get any congestion notification. So we might be, want to be more careful about the wording here. Yeah, um, it, it, I think it says if it wraps more than once, um, or it talks about whether it wraps more than once. Yeah, so I mean, I think the important point here is to be conservative about the point that you get a congestion notification and be less conservative about how many markings you had in case that is, imp that is an input to your congestion controller. Um, so maybe we can distinguish that and work this clearly. Okay. I think it's well, a minor point. Okay, maybe, maybe you can stick something on the list yeah. about that yeah. so that um, I've made a note of it, but that will make me remember and also it will make me understand what you're talking about. Yep, comment that on the mailing list, please. Um, Michael, as an individual. I had another Sorry. Point. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Um, and then uh, about the update section, right? Um, uh, I didn't realize that much that it actually says every, everywhere we update this section with this section, we update this section with this section, because I actually don't think we update the, the classic ECN mechanism. We just add something on top of it, right? No, it's a complete, it's, it, uh, everything in those sections is replaced from, in 3168, it's completely not relevant anymore. It's not added, okay. it's replaced. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. I have to double check. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, please do double check, yeah. We are running over time, so Michael, please be sure. Yeah, only, only a quick comment on slide 10. So um, it's correct. I would agree to two option code points. I've also offered other solutions than the ones that you have on the list. For example, you could use the length as another yeah. differentiator, or you could just add a bit in the beginning to make the first bit uh, sticky. Also, there are t uh, tons of solutions. How to sort this out. Um, the easiest one is probably the two option code points, and that would work well for me. But, uh, yeah, the, the, more I, solutions to this I, I, I admit I did filter. I filtered out the length one because I knew that Mia um, would um, originally didn't like that one. Um, maybe Mia can say something about this because um, it sort of means you can have variable size fields and things like that. And um, go on, Mia. You, you originally didn't like having different length um, to mean yeah, different. Yeah, we so like things. yeah. I have to I have to remember. But aren't we already have different lengths because you can always uh, leave out some of the fields if you don't need them, right? So this is already kind of used. Yeah, no. Th this was using the length field to determine the order of the fields. I don't quite know how it's going to be done, but um. we, don't have, we don't have the time to discuss this now. No, no, no. not the right time to do it. Uh, as I just said, I mean there are more solutions to the problem, but yeah. the easiest yeah. one might be number one. Please put that on the mailing list. Yeah, and anyway, I wanted to leave that until the post talk because he's going to talk about his bite, flags bite anyway, and, and if we decide to do that, there's another way of doing it. Martin. 
Yes, can someone briefly explain why we're why we need to hold this for ECT one, the, the decision in TSPWG? We just want to be on the safe side. That was I mean we have no particular reason. We just so when we when we discussed this, we we discussed this before TSV, and we were hoping things get cleaned up. So we are still hoping that things get cleaned up soon. If that doesn't um, work out, we need to reconsider. But that was that was the hope. Well, I'm, I'm pushing some quick resolution on that in TSVWG, but uh, okay. That's perfect. Hopefully, hopefully this won't matter. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Okay. So, okay. Eric, I, I, I do have a question to come back on that, and, and in that, um, you know, if, if that goes on and on in TSVWG, I would like this to not hang on it because um, um, yeah, it's just. What ha what happens otherwise is then the chairs say, well, no one's interested in this one anymore. It's been sitting around for two years and no one's talked about it, and that's because we're all waiting for something, you know. Um, Can I uh, reply as well? So the point is, we are ten minutes over now, so it's like I have to. Ilpo has to then speed up a bit or something else. Yep. Mia, yeah. Yes, yeah, so just I think there is no dependency um, from accurate ECN to AlphaS, but only the other way around. So I don't think we have to hold it up. The only tiny little um, design decision that might depend is like exactly what we're looking at right now with the order of the values in the option. But if we have a flexible option here, how to handle it, I don't see any dependency. Yeah. So the position was assuming that this cleans up soon, we would like to wait just to be on the safe side. Yes. If this doesn't work out, um, we will reconsider. So it's, the plan is not to hold this up for a large amount of time if the other stuff doesn't work out. That's totally fine for me. I'm just saying that I don't think there's yeah. a technical dependency. Yeah, it's fine for me too. Gori? It's Gori here as TSBWG chair. As soon as this is finished, run those updates through TSBWG. I don't think the dependencies are enough to hold the document. Okay. Okay. So then, thank you. We are 10 minutes over time. Um, Ilpo. Any minute you can give us back is perfect. Yeah. One, one additional thing why I had not wanted to Put, put this uh, yet to upstream is that if we if we make some wire format change, then for example related to this option kind, then then that's of course problematic if there's some pre-existing deployment with something else. So, so that's another thing. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, accuracy and Linux implementation. So if you go to the next slide, yeah. So uh, this is built on top of the earlier work like. Bob said, and the initially I started working with this when there was this 07, not 07, 09 uh, draft available. And as far as I know, this is the first implementation which actually includes the support for accurate ECN option. And uh, I discovered some technical challenges, but none seem to sort of make the all approach non-workable. So, so in that sense, we are good to go go with mo with the minor tweaks we have been doing, and uh, the feedback from the implementations uh, adopted into into uh, draft version 10, or mostly mostly it was adopted in that. So there are a large set of changes, and. Uh, in addition to the implementation, I have also created this unit, unit test suite. There are some URLs for those. Yeah. So next slide, please. So first, I'm going to talk about this uh, handshake reflector thing. So I give a bit background so that you might be on the might even understand the. Uh, might uh, 
understand what what is said on the next slide. So so Bob already covered some some of this. So so during the handshake we 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 will uh, be, feedback the feedback the easy and easy and field of the opposite uh, side and uh, or the opposite uh, handshake bucket. So and and in in the zero nine uh, Synac uh, ETN is encoded code point was encoded to third arc of the three 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 way handshake and also also of the first first data segment. So so this create additional problems because the soon bit is off and the reliable data channel was provided using this first data segment and it, it was to because because we in that case we would have wanted to avoid the ac field ambiguity so so that there is no different implementations all all similar segments we also need to use the same same encoding and some may be just a warning that we made also changes to this, this in the draft version 10 so next slide please and so first of all there are these related challenges related to read transmissions in general so so Bob partially covered covered this in his talk also so so when the easy and code both point of the original and read transmit are dif differing there are some scenarios that need to uh, need to be handled which the draft did not address and since the since the one the, since the end that is sending the packet does not know know uh, what the other end sees, so all this initialization needs to consider the uh, cases such that it is not it is safe safe, and also the behavior on C marking must consider consider the case where the only one one of those copies of the uh, Synac, for example, has has this uh, marking. Of course, it's not yet. It's in the easy and plus plus if we enable those, but this perhaps should already handle those cases. And uh, then then we come to this case where the soon bit is off. So so they were quite problematic. So so first of all, both the TX and RX side required additional state. Well, it was doable, but it was quite quite complicated to look into all these sequence numbers and it requires checking checking on the in the established state you need to do these additional checks for every every bucket whether it's it's now the time to use the reflector or not since it's overloading the same bits and because of this overloading there are some masking problems so so uh, and if only single sequence number is used used uh, by by this or make this reflector decision, it actually disables the accuracy and for the whole half connection uh, when when using an unidirectional flow since the sequence number of the other direction does not advance at all. So you are sending all the time the reflector so no accurate easy and at all. And then relatively small problem was related to segmentation of loading. So so since the reflector will have different header than the remaining or the other other segments after it, it's not possible to send them as a single chunk uh, downwards. And then the major problem was related to TCP fast open. open. So with fast open, open it can be so that uh, there are no third or the first data segment in a similar sense as we have for the non fast open case. So so and if we consider this this first bullet, so so when there are retransmissions, it's hard hard or actually it's impossible for the other end to know what the what the other end is actually seeing. So so they cannot really agree what is the first first sequence number or the first first bucket at all because because they might have seen different things than and then of course there is also this delayed arrival of the reflective value so 
it somehow limits on the limits what decisions can be made based on based on it. So next slide, please. And we we had uh, different different uh, or discussed different solutions to this and. Uh, tried to use both sequence numbers and also discussed about using option for this, but those were ruled out. So we simply made made the approach uh, less complex, and it of course has some downs downsides. So so it makes the signaling unreliable, but 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 it's still uh, rel relatively simple so and the good thing is that in if we put it only to the the reflector only only to the third third arc, we can use the existing state transits and then trigger so when we get soon enough we do one thing and when we move move to the established state that's a, other transition that is interesting to us and it means that we occasionally lose the lose the mangling direction but, but Feature is not loss of that feature seems not catastrophic. The more uh, problematic case is of course that it creates ambiguity. Uh, so so there can be similar ox ox later in the connection. So uh, which look exactly like 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 the uh, that first first bucket. So. So it might be possible that one ends up misinterpreting the ACE field in some cases, but again, it doesn't seem catastrophic. So the connection does not die, die because of that. And uh, the, this approach was adopted in the draft version 10. So next slide, please. And then, then the segmentation of loading had some uh, so has some cases it's good to bring up here. So so the CWR CWR flag handling differs from from that of the uh, three one six sixty eight and uh, the segmentation offloading for 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 that clear clears the CWR flag after after the first segment. So when you put, put Large, large segment, uh, or give it to the signal offloading hardware, which it, it it takes takes the CWR or sets the CWR only for the first segment. And another thing that should be considered that the offloading does not uh, does not hide the changes in the ACE field. And I, I made the required changes for the software-based offloading case, so this GSO or GRO, and on the on the receive path, uh, the CWR was used to sort of flush the pending pending block block, block of segments, uh, and the accurate easy and might have long long runs of segments which where this CWR flag is uh, set, so it of course would negatively affect affect the performance of accurate easy and easy and if it, if the offloading ends up uh, flushing after every segment. And then some thoughts about the hardware offloading. I I didn't actually te test test test. With any hardware offloading, but but uh, went deep enough that I think I understand uh, uh, the problem space. So so to allow allow the hardware offloading, there is there is uh, flag added to the SKB so such that such that it can indicate that accurate ECM processing is required, which is actually do nothing sort of, but because there is this existing CWR. Uh, clearing thing we need to need to uh, be prepared prepared to that. So if the hardware would clear clear the flag uh, on its own, it would of course corrupt the AC field. And it's not clear if the hardware which shop supports this CWR clearing can be made such that it is not this or it can be disabled so that it doesn't do do it. 
Yeah, so the next slide, please. And then 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 about the Aquatician option. So 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 the Aquatician option uh, ca carries this uh, least significant uh, bytes bytes of the uh, usually larger counters. So the draft says that they are probably twenty two bits or or more and uh, uh, the, I have 22-bit fields, not 20, but 32-bit uh, uh, fields for these counters, and they, they some some the uh, payload bytes you receive for particular ECN code points. And uh, uh, since the accurate ECN option is not always sent by the by the receiver, the draft only gives the minimum rules when the, when when the option should be sent. The uh, implementations must must or are expected to estimate. It's not mandatory, but are ex expected to sort of estimate the uh, counters while there is no where, while there is acts coming in which don't have the Aquatician option, and this requires. Uh, uh, heuristics to decide which counter is going to be increased when you get an act without, without the option. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so to support support, support this uh, uh, this uh, uh, heuristic, there is this this change triggered ox. The draft says that when when the when the easy and code point changes on the receiver side, you should create send send with this accurate easy and option. And the problem problem with that is that uh, since the since uh, the count, count, count since the code point change, you are actually increasing the. A new counter while you are while you on the earlier ox you you increase the uh, other ones. Uh, I realized that I might actually have problem in this figure now, which I have not noticed. So 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 uh, so uh, we need we would need to add some act without option between the data. Uh, 11 and 12 so so uh, so the so the uh, no no yeah so no 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 problem. so, so the rece receivers when it's sending this option it actually has changed change both both uh, uh, ECD one count, uh, byte counter and the C byte counter. So, so uh, the sending sign does not know which of the which of these counters is the is the one it should increase when it gets next time the act without the option. So, so after this uh, data 30, 30 data uh, bucket and this is problem with any any of the ed edges so 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 one could could build some heuristic but it 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 gets easily lost even if you use one one data or one one act packet it then uh, reverses to the uh, wrong wrong counter on every change trigger duck and to so solve this uh, the change was made to the trust so that so that the uh, option is now required for the change triggered arc and the ne uh, next arc you send after that. So, so in that later later arc, it's uh, unambiguous which of the fields actually actually is increasing. Yeah. May I just interrupt, Ilpa? Yeah. Um, you, you said it's required. It, it, it's still a should. Yeah. Um, and, and all these are shoulds. Uh, and I just wanted to give the context for this that you know, if you did all the shoulds, then you wouldn't have this problem anyway because you'd be having accurate ECN options on most packets. And um, this is only when you're really trying to be sparse about wh which packets you put accurate ECN options on, probably because you've got lots of other options and you're trying to 
um, be careful about how much space you use. Yeah. So on the next slide, I actually have now this proposal. So how this how, how this heuristic could be avoided. So if you put the next slide. Yeah, so so instead of using some heuristic to decide what the receiver is going to increase next, it could be included to the accurate ECN option. So if we add this count, uh, counter two-bit field uh, uh, in, into the option itself, it's possible to uh, use that value, value to increase, increase the uh, correct counter on the next stack. So it, you only need to get one one option true, and then then the uh, sender immediately knows what the receiver is going to do next. This, of course, would create other possibilities. So there are these extra extra bits uh, remaining remaining in the one octet bit that needs to be add, added if if this is chosen and this. Same field could be used, for example, for the field ordering, and there are uh, other possibilities. So that if there are no no byte counters included, if there is no acclosis, then then also also the count itself could uh, be used to do the byte counter switch. So so if there are any comments on this, I would like to like to hear our opinions. Yeah, so. We come to an end for the presentation, then we have time for a question. Or something. Yeah, so next slide. Uh, yeah, so and then 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 I I was I was looking looking to this graph graph and uh, in the appendix there are a lot of a uh, lot of uh, uh, algorithms which which sort of might help help to implement implement the option related related things and 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 uh, under some circumstances one might uh, with, when there is a losses losses the estimation might actually res res result in increasing the uh, wrong wrong counter and that needs to be corrected downwards when when the uh, Option option next time comes comes in and uh, uh, the draft is was or I think it still has some problems in this uh, so that uh, they, it's using this uh, unsigned uh, mo modulo which is problematic because it cannot correct downwards and uh, there are two two ways to so solve this either either use Use uh, signed signed delta uh, so that the counter can also decrease. Uh, or uh, alternatively, one would need to duplicate all the all the counters on the sender side, which seems somewhat wasteful. And another problem related to this sm relatively small small field, so only 24 four bits, is that it it cycles relatively soon so so the draft must ensure that or should ensure that uh, that the counters do not overflow so so the option must be included uh, every now and then to ha handle that case so next slide please and then 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 there is this uh, uh, Heuristic in the in the uh, appendix, there's algorithm which uh, uses this delta for the uh, uh, C B. So so this byte counter delta delta is used to rule out the A C overflows and and in order to run that algorithm, one actually needs to have this delta delta available. So so uh, so it seems uh, good from robustness point of view that every every time the uh, ace field is uh, 
changed also also to include the option so so that the uh, CB uh, delta can be calculated from from numbers that are up to date. It's not uh, absolutely required, but but still seems good defense in the like approach. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, okay. okay, so I, I didn't have more. If if okay. we want, we, we can take take a look on this box no. slide. I don't have we, it. We don't have any. We are running over time, so okay, yeah. sorry about that. Um, any comments? Yoshi. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, about TCP option, do we need 24 bits for counting bits? And maybe if we can squeeze to 22 bits, we can create some rooms. Yeah, I suppose it would be possible to also decrease the size of the fields. It only means that the option needs to be sent more frequently. And of course, if there would be long, long loss of acts, then then some problems might happen, but not very likely, I think. Can I just come back on that, um, Yoshi? Um, the, you have one minute. Yeah, the, the uh, ACE field is just three bits, and that, that doesn't use byte counting at all. Um, and the algorithm is designed to work with just that. Um, the byte counters are there if you have space for them. And um, so sort of reducing them to be less accurate um, seems to be a bit bit of a sort of halfway house that maybe is a bit too complicated um, to given you're only using them when you've got space for them anyway. I'm closing the line after Mia. 30 seconds. Mia? Yeah. I should unmute them. <laughs> <laughs> to the question about the option. Um, I'm not sure I actually still fully understand the problem because at least if the CE counter increases in the option, it should also, the, also the S, uh, ACE field should increase. So you should be able to distinguish those cases, which is the most common case, right? So I don't, I'm not sure if the, the problem is as big um, as you describe it. And then if we need a solution, I think it's, the solution is fine to send basically two more um, X with options as you have proposed. I don't think we need a separate field for that in the, in the option. But maybe to phrase the question, did you, did you look at this uh, case that you can use the ACE field to distinguish better which counter has been increased? Yeah, well, it's possible to use that, but then, then it means that you only can use two, two of the, two of the, uh, uh, easy and code points to really really run this kind of heuristic. And another thing is that there is this uh, cross checking between these fields. So so uh, on the if we base some checking checking on the other and then the other way around, it of course creates this uh, nasty loop loop of checks. So so I I suppose it it might be possible to use it, but there are these and... Yeah, I think we should look into that and also th to the point that you cannot distinguish uh, ETC1 and ETC0. So I just want to state again that I think the requirements or the, the base design guides we had at the beginning was that we want to make sure we don't lose a congestion signal. So we don't want to run into the case where you got a CE and you, and you don't get the information that it was there and you cannot react to it. So that's why we have the CE in the header and that's why it's important to always have the accurate information about the CE. And the other thing we discussed very intensively at the beginning is that we um, don't want as a requirement to also check the order of the different markets or to provide the order. If that's a side effect, if you can get it, that's fine, but it wasn't a requirement. Okay, please discuss this further on the mailing list. Um, from the church perspective, we very much appreciate this um, implementation effort in reporting about the experiences we think this improve the implementation, uh, not, not the implementation, but um, the standard and the draft. Both the implementation and the draft, thanks a lot for that, yes. That's yeah. So thank you very much. Um, we are still over time. Uh, the next is Yu Chung, um, reporting about the um, results of the REC.
working group last call. Hi, um, I'm here to present the RAC uh, draft, um, uh, especially to our plan to address the working group last call comments. Um, next slide, please. So um, basically, the, uh, there are three things um, that we need to address, three categories. One is uh, some bugs in the pseudocode. Um, and the other is some protocol uh, changes um, in order to enhance it uh, based on the comments. And the last one are you know, a lot of writing suggestions. There needs to be a major surgery on writing. So they type in the first one. The first one is the bug that uh, Elpo found uh, uh, that the uh, loss retransmit is unclear how that would actually work in, uh, from the pseudocode. And uh, there is a small bug in the pseudocode that we need to define that uh, when you are sending uh, or resending uh, a packet, uh, you need to mark the packet loss. Um, that's uh, false again. You need to reset that mark. So that's the bug, uh, which we will correct that in the next uh, iteration, and then we will put more words on how loss of retransmit detection uh, will work uh, more because it was a bit vague. Next slide, please. Um, the next one is a comment from Teresa um, that it's not clear how RAC can apply in the RTO recovery because the text suggests that mainly this is a change to the TCP class recovery, but that's actually not the case. Uh, RAC is for both file recovery and RTO recovery, so we're going to put more text. <laughs> so here is the very simple intuitive uh, example, like why RAC even matter in RTO recovery, because supposedly it's just a timer fire and then you mark the first packet loss, right? And then you retransmit that. Why would RAC even matter? So let's have a example. Let's say at time T0, you send one packet. And the RTO is one second. So you put a one second timer on. Then at um, 999 milliseconds, you send another one. Or maybe you send another 10 big. So you total send 11 packets. One millisecond later, the RTO timer uh, fires, and then he says, you know what, all the packets are pending are uh, lost. So this is clearly unlikely um, because you just send the last 10 packets, right? So if you think of why that's unlikely, because you look at the transmit time of this packet, um, and many uh, that we know didn't have this kind of check before. This is essentially the same principle as RAC, right? You want to look at the last, the most recent transmission time and now, so you can judge whether the packet is likely lost or not. And then you can put some reordering window allowance. Um, so that's the change that RAC would recommend you apply uh, for the TCP recovery. And essentially, the pseudocode is very similar, uh, which we put it here, but it will share a lot of commonality with the main RAC code. So we will break that into some stuff. And this is also what's implemented uh, Linux uh, as well. And we have found that this actually reduces a lot of unnecessary retransmission during RTO. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we are going to put in the new RAC uh, iteration. Uh, sorry, revision. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that many uh, people recommend is that uh, we should really make the reordering timer um, a should instead of a may because uh, it has to improve the performance. And we are going to change that uh, because we agree with both uh, uh, comments. Um, and to recap, a reordering timer is to say, all right, this packet is not there to mark as lost because we're still waiting for the reordering timer to expire. But of course, if there is no further act event, then you know we will have to wait for RTO and that's default. So RAC recommends installing this reordering timer uh, when the reordering window um, uh, expires. And it does help uh, improving the performance, especially in the application limited uh, cases. 
Um, another comment that suggested by uh, Elpo, again, is that it's unclear how long should we wait for this timer. So, for example, you have 10 packets, right? And the very first one, the wielding timer will expire in one millisecond, and the last one will expire after five millisecond or the five millisecond. Uh, the idea is to put it on the five millisecond um, <clears throat> so that when the timer expires, many packets will uh, be marked as lost with confidence. It's more conservative, and we like this approach because. Even though the, you may fast retransmit a little bit slower uh, because you set a timer that's more conservative, but since RAC is about dealing with the ordering, we feel a more conservative timer may be slightly lose on the performance optimization. It's still a good um, trade off. <clears throat> so, um, next slide, please. Um, so now it comes to the right cut uh, most people's uh, suggestions. Um, needs a lot of uh, major surgery. Uh, the biggest one, which we agree, that the current TLP part of the draft writes more like a, an add-on, an appendix. It's like you glued the draft onto it. Uh, so we are going to definitely uh, rewrite a lot of part of it, including mention that in the actual uh, abstract introduction and overview and the design rationale. Um, the next uh, comment is about <clears throat> the overview is too terse, in that it's too simplified. We really should explain RAC and TLP protocol um, in more detail instead of like four sentences. Uh, so that's what we are going to extend to. Um, and also, uh, uh, I think Martin suggested a table of content and yeah, because the draft is already very long. Um, and um, we are going to remove the experiment and performance evaluation. I think it serves the purpose when it was an experimental um, draft, but now it's a post standard draft. So probably don't need that. But um, if you actually feel strong that we should keep it there, I'm happy to discuss on the list as well. And uh, just as a side, we are going to reply every reviewer's email separately uh, as well. But right now we're just going through all of them and make sure that, you know, if we're going to change one thing that would please three reviewers that have opinion <laughs> on the same part of the All right, next slide, please. Um, a lot of qualification uh, questions. Um, I think the most important one is we, the author, all the four authors, have no intention encourage more network reordering with or without rack. So uh, the text definitely needs to clarify that because we use some words things that would make it sound like, hey, we introduce, we, we want to have rack, so network can reorder things to help. No, that's absolutely not our intention. Our intention is to say, look, we have found reordering exists and we want to make CCP more robust. But by no means we want to encourage more reordering because reordering by any time is really not going to do well for the performance uh, on the receiver side, uh, particularly. Um, so we will be more explicit uh, on that. Uh, the other is people are kind of confused reading through the text. Like, so what's the dependency between TLP, RAC, SAC, EFAC, limited transmit? It's like all over the place. So here is the rack requires stack, TLP requires uh, rack. Um, when I say TLP requires uh, rack, it is possible to implement TLP without rack. Uh, that comes with a lot more ambiguity and a lot more complexity uh, because that's what we did in Linux before. And then we decided to get rid of that part because it just doesn't work that complexity in the stack to deal with a kind of like outdated stack that doesn't support stack. Um, so uh, another one is about EFAC and limited transmit. They are both uh, recommended, uh, but if the stack do not support um, that, it's okay uh, too. 
also more clarity about how rack and segment of loading uh, should handle. For example, a TCP segment of loading would bunch many packets into one sort of uh, jumbo frame. So how do we handle that need more clarity? Uh, so we will uh, do that. Also, like how the reordering timer, uh, we talk about how we set up it, but how do we cancel those timers? So these are also important um, details we need to look at. <clears throat> And then uh, the last thing is um, the rack reordering window. We say initially started with a quarter of RTP, but if no reordering is detected, it's now reduced to zero. And then how does that really work with Kubernetes? We said, oh, we can also use super stretch. And the text is just not clear how all this interacts. So we are going to clean that up uh, too. Um, <clears throat> And uh, make sure that we clarify like how Rack uses or implements the new stretch uh, code um, heuristic. Next slide, please. Um, last one is uh, there are a lot of um, wordings that uh, sounds like unsubstantiated. Uh, mean that we will say, okay. Uh, uh, for example, um, the we'll say, oh, all this uh, loss recovery technique for don't work um, without citing any scientific uh, studies, right? Um, or um, things that is like, oh, there's a prevalence of loss retransmission. There are a lot of ordering, uh, blah, 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 it's common. All that we will remove um, and make sure that we don't sort of uh, talk this kind of thing without data. Uh, if anything, we'll say rock is to deal with reordering, right? And on some network, the reordering can be very prevalent. Um, and uh, there are also things like offering unclear sort of options, like uh, rock can be supplemental, rock can be optional, or some feature can be optional. And But then we say rock requires certain stuff to happen. Um, which can just create confusion. So we'll all cut those uh, text out. Um, and then there is like a wording of oh, the underlying network may introduce more reordering, and that may may be interpreted differently. Like we encourage to do more reordering. That's really not our intention. So we'll chop all this text uh, just so that we don't create confusion. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide. Um, so that's my last slide, and I want to thank all the reviewers. Uh, it's not a complete list, but uh, really, um, we appreciate all these very thorough uh, reviews, and we are going to do major search really on the text, uh, hopefully soon, and then address all the comments individually uh, from the um, on the emails. And if you have more comments, uh, feel free to send us uh, your comments and. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, from the chair's perspective, I also um, would like to say thank you very much to all the um, reviewers. This will improve the document substantially. Um, any questions? Then I would say thank you, thank you, um, Yu Chang, and we are looking um, forward to getting an updated document. Um, thank you very much. So this concludes the part um, of working group documents, and um, we are still over time. So if you can speed up your presentation, it's appreciated. Um, the next one is Maj, uh, about um, a Yang model um, for TCP. All right, thanks, Michael. All right, so, uh, sorry for showing up as Netron Working Group. Uh, I am here as an individual contributor, not representing the Netron Working Group. We know this um, problem. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is I'm not a TCP expert, and therefore for this presentation, I'm going to lean a little bit on my co-authors um, on the TCP portion. I'm more of a Yang person. Um, and finally, this presentation is a combination of uh, the updates to Dash 
03 and 04 version of the draft. Uh, we had planned to, of course, present in 106, but ran out of time. Um, and so this presentation is a combination of what we wanted to present in 106 and what we wanted to also present in 107. All right. With that, let's go to the next slide. So the updates in three and four include, of course, the fact that we now officially support the, uh, the NMDA um, portion of uh, a Yang, uh, which essentially introduced um, two new data stores, the ones in blue, the intended and operational data store. This is more for informational purposes, not that it impacts significantly the model, other than the fact that um, all new models need to support it and that they don't need to replicate operational para parameters in a separate container. Um, the second uh, update essentially refined the scope of what we wanted to include in the model. Um, it, we wanted to, it to be more than just groupings, and the proposal was, uh, and that we go into more detail in subsequent slides is what we wanted to include as a result of that change. Next slide, please. All right, so coming into 106, what we were going to propose was that uh, was four items that we wanted to refine the scope for this round. The first one is, should the model support TCP statistics? The second, of course, is, should it model all TCP connections? Uh, and, of course, the third and fourth is, what security uh, options should we support for TCP? Um, so we took a stab and we actually went ahead and tried to add that support in uh, 04. And I'll discuss the rationale for each one of them in subsequent slides. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so the first question we asked is, should the model support statistics? Um, the rationale for it is management is not just configuration, it's also monitoring, and therefore statistics play an important part of that. The next question obviously was what statistics we were going to support, so we took a look at what the MIB supports today for TCP. And we said, well, that's a good start for us. So we're going to support that to begin with. Um, next question, uh, slide, please. Um, the second question is, should we model all TCP connections? Um, so if left to um, not, if we decided not to model TCP connections, and the applications um, that needed to look up a TCP connection would then model it. Therefore, the modeling would get distributed in different uh, models, other young models that wanted to look up TCP connections. So best thing was for us to consolidate it in one place. Um, we have a precedence in the fact that the TCP MIP already models the TCP connections. And we took a cue from other Yang models that do this, um, particularly the BFT and the interfaces Yang model, both of which model, uh, either model all the BFT sessions or all the interfaces respectively. Um, and finally, it allows for, of course, other models to be able to refer to this when they want to look up a particular TCP connection. Next slide, please. And the question of whether we should, uh, uh, of course, add support for TCP AO, um, not only the rationale being that today the BGP Yang model actually relies on um, being able to configure TCP AO, at least it plans to, it is already in the model. And um, since there is a requirement to secure BGP connections, obviously we would need that support. And I just list out the parameters that we want to model as part of that. The key and the keychain part for that configuration would of course come from the ITF keychain model that has already become an RFC. Next slide, please. 
So there was a little bit of controversy for why we wanted to support TCP MD5, but it ultimately comes down to what the market is asking for. And whether we like it or not, there are existing deployments of BGP that use MD5. And BGP has decided that because of that, they need that support from the TCP model. Next slide, please. So this is a issue that is uh, new and they are tracking this uh, as part of the draft is today the TCP common grouping is, um, which of course defines the configuration for TCP keepalites is defined in another draft, um, which is being tracked in the NetConf working group. Uh, so it's an open question to this working group whether they would like to have it moved to the, uh, this working group. Um, the pros is, of course, that yes, uh, it, the common grouping then becomes part of the Yang model. The downside is that today, Netcon has already uh, made quite a bit of progress on that draft and is ready to close to publishing it. If we decide to move it into the TCP Yang model, of course, it'll all, uh, cause a misref to all the existing net contracts uh, reference it, but also um, delay, I guess, uh, will put more pressure on publication of the TCP Yang model. All right, with that said, uh, let's move quickly into, I think, what should be the last slide. Yeah. Um, so why are we asking for work group adoption? Well, clearly there's a use case today. Um, the BGP Yang model is already incorporated. The draft version of the Yang model, uh, the TCP Yang model for authentication purposes. Um, and also because the authors have believed that the model as it is being presented is fairly mature, or at least the work that should continue going forward should be happening in the work group. And therefore, we are asking for work group adoption. Questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the, work, well, the the question was already raised on on the mailing list. We got some feedback um, in favor of it. We got some feedback um, which suggests not to adopt it. Um, are there any positions um, from people which can quickly state it here now or? Um, Okay, so then that's the input we have and we have to figure out if, um, how we proceed with this. The decision, uh, the, the chairs have not decided yet. We wanted to see if we get additional input here. Um, Mirja is coming and Martin. No, what? No, not Mirja, Martin. Yeah, can, can the authors, anyone else articulate what the, um, any TCP implementations are likely to, to use this to enable that comp configuration? So, Michael, maybe, um, my co author, maybe he can try to see if he can answer the question. Uh, uh, sorry, can you please repeat? I didn't fully get the question. Yeah, sorry. Um, do we know of any TCP implementations that are interested in using that comp to? to this, this Yang model and that comp to, to, to configure themselves? I mean, there are, for, for this model, there are two use cases um, in the NetConf working group and in the other one. The NetConf uh, model at the moment is independent, so this is where the keeper life exists. Uh, as far as I understand, there is commercial interest in configuring keeper life uh, through a Yang model, but that is at the moment outside the specific model here. Um, other than that, at the moment, I'm not aware of any implementation who is doing this right now, but given that this relates to, to other working groups, um, of course, uh, Yang implementation sooner or later could emerge. 
Of course, I mean, I've said this many times on the mailing list, it's relatively unlikely that typical host operating systems will use Yang for TCP configuration. So this model by and large targets probably TCP stacks on devices that use Yang for configuration already for other purposes, such as routers. Yeah. If this answers the question. Uh, yeah, I think I, I had, uh, I think a similar question. Um, I'm, I'm relatively neutral to this work because I think it doesn't hurt. Um, we, but like if we adopt it, we have to make sure that the model is correct and that needs a little bit of work. It needs a little bit of interest from people. It needs commitment for people to um, do the work. And I do have the feeling that we should rather um, try to finish up the work we already have on our plate before we adopt this as a new item. Okay. Anything else? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to speak as uh, from the floor. So there's um, uh, as one thing that is not fully mentioned on the slide deck. So the, the, um, there is a question on the scope of the model. And for example, loss was pushed back against adoption. Um, is a little bit concerned about whether this this work is doable, which is a reasonable comment. So the the, the the, the two options that the working group has is either to focus on this model relatively narrowly and mostly to what Mahesh has presented right now. Um, so these would be the um, basically the model attributes that are needed in other working groups. The other solution is to significantly expand the model, um, um, for example, for standard TCP stack configuration. In past meetings, there has been from the floor asked for that, and I've tried to add this to the model uh, to some extent, but that in results in quite a bit of additions. Uh, also for example, uh, configuring ECN, turning on and off timestamps and the like. And um, so one question to the working group is if, for example, there are concerns about the complexity of the model, if we narrow the scope. And to basically what Mahesh has presented right now, because this to me seems a lower hanging fruit and the more complex general TCP configuration could be done in a follow up work as well. So that to the, that's a question to the floor. If those who have asked for a relatively sophisticated configuration model, if they really insist in that being done in, that in, in this specific draft. I'm closing the line after Martin. Martin, you're up. And just in response to that, speaking as an individual, um, <clears throat> I would encourage the working group to focus on to focus the work on no use cases. Uh, you know, if you, there are a couple of things here and there that are easy to add in. That's fine, but this is a potentially very large project. The TCP configuration space is massive. And um, I, I don't want to spend a ton of cycles on stuff that, that has no deployment path. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we will discuss this and come to some conclusion. OK, thank you. Um, next is um, Praveen on High Start, plus plus. Um, be as quick as possible. Hi, uh, this is Praveen uh, today to talk about iStart++. Uh, we have posted a new draft uh, version of this, uh, version 3, uh, recently incorporating some feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a quick recap. So the problem is that uh, traditional slow start can overshoot the ideal send rate, and this causes a massive loss on the uh, bottleneck buffer. Uh, and, bottleneck, and then we uh, spend several RTTs recovering from those losses. Uh, the goal is to reduce uh, those losses and uh, re resulting retransmission timeouts that can cause uh, problems and slow completion time. Uh, so this is based on the original high start paper, but we use only the delay increase algorithm. Um, and we compensate for uh, premature exit from slow start uh, that can happen as a result of uh, delay increase. Uh, for that, we start using a limited slow start, uh, which provides us a faster ramp compared to what uh, just congestion avoidance would have done. 
uh, but we take the maximum of both so that on uh, uh, long uh, you know van links we can get better performance uh, if uh, the uh, connection runs longer. Uh, next slide, please. So this is some performance data. Uh, I presented the lab data very quickly at the last IETF, but ran out of time. Uh, but we also got some production data as well. Uh, this is very recent. Uh, I got these numbers like two days back. Uh, this is basically every connection uh, on, a, on a Windows system. We were doing an A-B test. Uh, this includes connections that are primarily downloaded as well, which is why 99% uh, of connections actually have very few RTOs, uh, but we still see uh, the graph shift uh, to the left. So we have fewer RTOs. Uh, so about 0.64 connections uh, went from one RTO to zero RTOs over lifetime, and 0.7 connection percent connections went from two RTOs to one RTO. The trend continues. Uh, uh, so we are also looking at other metrics, uh, possibly like uh, success percentage of loss recovery, etc. Uh, this is pretty difficult to do in the wild because it's not like one workload it's not a single workload. it's basically just all tcp connections period so uh, this is ongoing work and we'll have more data over time uh, we also have lab data which actually shows very excellent results so this is just with uh, simulating uh, loss and latency on on, on basically uh, uh, trying to simulate van links and uh, seeing performance improvements for um, in both uh, good put and we are also seeing a lot of uh, retransmission timeout reductions across all the tests. Uh, next slide, please. So we already had a few reviews, uh, thanks to all the reviewers. Uh, so summary of changes, uh, we had to clarify the relationship with ABC. Uh, the draft was sort of uh, assuming that, but we didn't call it out. Uh, uh, yeah. So we actually have now incorporated text saying that this is to be used with appropriate byte counting. Uh, we also clarified when exactly the algorithm ends, uh, which is upon encountering the first condition signal. Uh, fix the equations uh, where there was some confusion between using uh, a particular uh, variable that was in bytes versus segments. And we also clarified some of the variable names, uh, made them uh, better. I think they were mislead misleadingly, for example, re referring to this low start threshold. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is deployed pretty widely. Uh, we are looking into future optimizations, like maybe using bandwidth or throughput estimate to make this better instead of just using a delay signal. That's ongoing work. Um, and then future, we would like to uh, compare all the possible options for uh, for startup uh, and do some sort of A/B testing to see uh, what kind of results we can get from that. And then my request would be that uh, we adopt this document in uh, TCPM. That's all. Can I just call it? Sorry. I'm not sure if I lost audio or not. Can people hear me? Yes. yes. I <laughs> included myself and I just got to speak now, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, so on the slide you say there is a 39% performance improvement for short flows and 40% for long flows. Um, so that's basically um, because you have less RTO um, reductions, right? Uh, correct. So what, what ends up happening is that there is there's less loss, right? So we spend fewer RTTs actually uh, spending time recovering from those losses, and also the 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 congestion window. For example, like if we took an RTO, if the, if the loss was massive, uh, then we would actually take a retransmission timeout, which would basically drop the congestion window down to like one packet. So we avoid all sorts of problems by uh, not uh, overshooting the rate. So, but those where you don't have an, an additional RTO or whatever, I think there is like a little tiny chance that it takes actually longer for the transmission to like tiny long, tiny little bit longer to to compete, right? Um, uh, is that the case, or is there no drawbacks at all? 
Uh, so yeah, we we basically avoid those losses. So that's why these flows complete sooner. So uh, the the go overshooting is actually a bigger problem than being conservative. So you have some cases where something. it takes longer. As far as we observed, in none of the tests we had worse performance. Okay, and by performance you basically mean time to finish. Uh, yeah, time flow completion time, correct. Okay, thanks. Martin. Turn on your audio. I think Richard is next. Yeah, I got Richard. Richard? Martin? Yeah, this is all right. I'm very confused about the queue, but um, thank you for being for this, uh, for your work on this. Um, do you have can you say what you're thinking behind making this an informational draft rather than something with experimental or proposed standard force? Uh, I actually don't mind be it being like experimental. Uh, the reason it is informational is we wanted to document our implementation and encourage more adoption and more experimentation. Uh, but I'd be open to uh, to changing the uh, the document type. Last chance, last chance for Richard. So, uh, is my mic now open? Ten, nine. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Okay. Uh, I like this. I like this work very much uh, because I also perceive uh, buffer overshoot as the most uh, significant problem that uh, we are facing in our environments. So I would, uh, I would like to have this adopted as a working group item eventually. Okay. Uh, Yoshi. Closing the um, mic up, Martin. Yoshi. I'm fast. I'm okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so one thing, you know, if it's informational, uh, and you don't have to reflect the comment, you know, because it's just what the Microsoft is doing. But if you, you know, change the status for experiment, or you might seriously need to think about incorporate the comments from the people's idea. If you they suggest a change the logic. You have to seriously think about the change the logic. Okay, Martin, again. Yeah, so, sorry to um, break it up in multiple comments, but I, I, uh, um, I, I do support adopting this work. Uh, if there are other people interested in implementing this, then I would encourage us moving from informational to some other state. Uh, and I, I certainly sense interest in this. I, I can't speak to whether or not anyone plans to implement it. That would be, that maybe we don't need to present that today, but um, I would like to get some feedback on that. And if there are people interested in implementing, I think we should choose a more aggressive state. Unfortunately, okay. if, we chose to choose, if we choose to go standard, we could do something about the status of ABC, which is experimental, but I think we can overcome that if that's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. So from the from the floor, I get positive feedback on um, on adoption on the adoption question. So um, we will discuss this between the chairs and um, go to the mailing list. Um, okay, thank you, Praveen. Um, the next is a presentation about um, egg handling for wireless transports. And we are very short on time, so if you can get it done in 10 minutes instead of 20, that would be really great. Hello. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, so this talk is about uh, reducing the acknowledgement overhead uh, for the transports. Uh, most of the work that we had done was in context to uh, was not in context of the TCP, but uh, on a UDP-based transport. But some of the observations that we got, we thought we might be able to port, uh, port it to TCP as well. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So in, in, in the context of wireless, the cost of transfer frame transmission is, is, is significant regardless of its size. So uh, the interframe spacing is it causes most of the overhead and even though the act packet size is small, it still has a major impact on the uh, on the on the control overhead as well as uh, on the on the uh, wireless spectrum. So, 
this this problem is further exacerbated because of uh, high uh, at the newer Wi-Fi specifications, especially like 802.11 AC and Wi-Fi 6, which uh, which has much uh, faster fire rates, and it uh, it sort of accentuates the problem. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, our scenario was very straightforward, very, very uh, so it did it did not involve. Uh, and the end-to-end -end path was was a single hop. We we tried solving the problem for for a specific scenario where we have a phone, and we were doing a wireless projection to a television. Or the, the most of the transfers were for the local transfer. So what we what, what we found that TCP was resulting in a lot of back overhead, and this was uh, degrading the overall good put of the of of the link. Uh, we thought whether it would be possible for us to improvise existing TCP, and we tried to check what the knobs are, and we couldn't find any. I mean, we could find some of some of those, but it could it didn't give us the kind of expected uh, ACK reduction that we were hoping for. And that's where uh, uh, that's where we decided to do something about it. Next slide. Next slide, please. So ACK. The, the, there are just two ways of reducing the ACK. One is by byte counting ACK or ABC, and the other is the periodic ACK. So essentially, what our proposal is the combination of these two, and how do how 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 in what context to be made use of, which which one to make use of in what context. That is uh, basically the fundamental point here. Uh, there is another aspect where there is a loss, in which case, just like Quick does, Quick uh, requires you to just transmit the ACK. ACK as soon as you receive an out-of-order packet, so we handle it that way. Uh, but essentially, if, if if the things are normal, if there is less lo lo uh, loss rate, then it's essentially the choosing between byte counting act versus the periodic act. Next slide, please. So this this is what this is what we attempted. So uh, if the BDP is small, eventually the byte counting act gets used. And if the BDP is large, eventually the periodical act gets used. So what happened is uh, uh, with 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 near with near wireless standards, the BDP is significantly increasing. And if if the BDP is increasing, then uh, naturally it results in more more amount of acts getting generated. Uh, we wanted to limit this act by making use of periodical act rather than uh, sending act on per on every uh, uh, based on byte counting act. Uh, the next point is triggering acts for an out of order data reception. This is this is a well known. Uh, this is how it is handled in Quake already. So uh, uh, we we followed the same uh, mechanism here. Next one, please. So this this graph this this diagram shows you how much of a reduction in terms of act were we able to achieve. If you see in in the context of 802.11b, the performance was almost similar to TCP. Uh, it, it couldn't re uh, reduce much, but when it comes to 802.11 AC and uh, and uh, and and the date and the uh, wireless uh, interfaces which has higher data rates, we can clearly see that there is a big reduction in 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 in, in the number of acknowledgments. Uh, the difference here, uh, so, so here, if you see, you don't see much of a reduction in context of 802.11b. On the graph, but the numbers alongside will show you the uh, show you the reduction. Next slide. Please. The good put improvements. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, the graph on the left hand side shows the good put improvement. This is the difference difference between the TAC versus the TCP. Uh, so it what it shows essentially is that. It has a good impact on the overall good put of the TCP or uh, of the overall transport. So on the right hand side, what we see here is eventually the 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 tax eventually the reaches the good put the best uh, good put uh, efficiency at L is equal to two as TCP requires almost L, uh, L is equal to sixteen theoretically L is equal to sixteen. So. Reducing the acknowledgement has a direct direct impact on the good put. There. And next slide, please. 
So, uh, I mean, uh, I don't need to go, go into the details of this. Of course, when we are saying that we are reducing the acknowledgement, it has its own uh, repercussions. It's going to increase the traffic bills. Uh, eventually, what we want to say is there are specific connections, that are specific connections which can benefit from ag reductions. And some of the, some of the assumptions that TCP makes in context to generalize, making a generalized scheme uh, may not necessarily be true in certain, uh, certain, uh, certain scenarios. Uh, basically, enforcing some of the conditions which uh, TCP mandates for all the connections may not necessarily be uh, may, may not necessarily uh, be productive in all the situations. Is what we are trying to say. Next slide, please. So, uh, one question that naturally arises is, what is the lower bound for acts which which is which is possible? So, there is a seminal work uh, uh, in SICOM basically which says that. The a minimum of two acts are required per cent window. Uh, so ideally, in ideal condition, that should work. That that might, that, that might work without much impacting the true uh, the the transport performance. Right? That four acts is what is which suffices to maintain the performance. But having said that, four acts by itself still results in other problems. Uh, so, so just using four acts per cent window might not be good enough. Uh, that's where uh, so the formula that I had mentioned previously comes into picture. Next slide, please. So some of the side effects that are the, the I mean, this, uh, the side effects of the act thinning are, are widely documented. You know, it has uh, impact on loss recovery. It has impact on traffic burstiness. In fact, in fact, the bursts are significant. Uh, one of the side effects that we saw was uh, if the burst increases, eventually it results in much better Wi-Fi aggregation at the lower level. Uh, that's a side effect. Having said that, I understand that this is not a generalized statement. Uh, it it has an it has a positive impact in a particular context. What it, but 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 what it say what it means is it still has a positive impact in at least some in some context. After which. Uh, it is possible for us to set connection-specific parameters to handle such kind of uh, scenarios. Another problem that we faced was the RTT estimation. So naturally, with fewer number of acts, the RTT estimation will will have an impact. RTT minimum minimum RTT estimation will have an impact, uh, especially under under the conditions where there is high jitter. Uh, the distance between the two devices increases. It, it, it has a much bigger impact. There was something that we experimented with, we were making use of one-way delay and then approximating it towards the RTT main. While it works in near symmetric cases, it might not work in asymmetric cases. Uh, so, so, so it's again, it's not a generalized, it's, it's, it's a spe specialized solution uh, for a specific problem statement that we are trying to solve. Uh, next slide, please. So there is already existing work in the ITF that's happening. Uh, wanted to compare it with uh, what's happening. Uh, uh, maybe this 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 part we can just skip over. Uh, it's already there uh, on the mailing list. Uh, so what what do we bring to the working group? So we wanted to bring our data set to the working group, saying that you know there are uh, so there are certain assumptions which may not make sense in specific scenarios. Uh, where there are certain techniques which can be used, which can improvise on the estimation of RTT mean, for example. Uh, there are certain techniques which could be used to reduce the burstiness of traffic. Of course, pacing can be used, and pacing, uh, pacing has other implications uh, if, if, if used in context to wireless scenarios. But uh, uh, ideally, what we're saying is it should be possible to tune the TCP parameters on or the transport parameters on per connection basis and take it from there. I think I, I think we have a question on uh, on the mic. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, I'm happy to let you finish. But if you're finished, I um, I, I actually yeah. came in just saying uh, wanting to say, you know, we have to be very careful that we don't um, aim for. Um, speed in, uh, over latency, and, and um, mm -hmm. but I think I, I guess that's obvious. Um, yeah. I, I guess the um, other point that I wanted to make 
was that um, can, where can you go back to the previous slide was it I think I can't uh, I don't know whether it was previous or the one before anyway um, the um, uh, sorry I've forgotten what I was going to say forget it so then may I, may I jump in front of the queue here because Bob was jumping in front of me um, first uh, I'm observed that you have missed uh, XCC in your list of uh, previous work. So um, that's basically the explicit uh, way that a sender uh, can ask a receiver to uh, to thin out the acknowledgments. Uh, so um, maybe a good idea to look at this as well. And uh, also basically in conjunction with what uh, Bob already said, um, it appears to me that you're looking primar uh, primarily into um, uh, web type traffic where objects get um, get uh, forwarded in, uni, uh, uni, uh, in one direction only, but I would be very interested uh, what the implications here would be for transaction data, where um, the sender's uh, role uh, very very frequently change between uh, both ends of the TCP connections. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so, so this this has to be generalized. So there, there, there is some observations we have in context to what happens if there is periodic app limited data in both the sites, uh, uh, and how do we handle it? Uh, I, I think this is something that we would like to update in the in, in the near future. Thank you, Praveen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, current TCP stacks, my understanding is already do uh, stretch hacking. Uh, that can be because a packet get batched, or it could be because of uh, you know things like uh, LRO, where packets you know get coalesced in hardware or in software. So uh, there's already stretch hacking being done by most major TCP implementations. So in your practice, in your data, are you really seeing an hack every two packets? That would be slightly surprising to me. No, 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 no not hack every two packets, but still the hacking hack reduction even after uh, even after the underlying. Is is not to an extent where it actually has. Uh, so so we see that there is it is possible to further reduce the overall overall ACK uh, quantity. So there is Wi-Fi aggregation also down the uh, down the line, uh, which 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 will re which will result in coalescing of packets. But uh, the the impact that it has. So what happens is what we found is if the transport layer is not in control of this reduction while some other layer is doing it, and it has a much negative impact. On the overall behavior, then, then, then. So this is something that you know. I think we should have put more uh, objectively in the draft. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Thank you, Gori. And I'm closing the line after Gori. Gori, if you are saying something right now, you are muted. Yep. Um. Thank you. Um, I, I like this work. Um, I'm interested in this space. Um, we, we did a lot of work with Quick, and in doing that, we noticed that Quick was a lot better for doing this than TCP was because they had to pick up the little things. So I'm interested in how you see all the corner cases. I think we might need quite a lot of data for different paths and different uses. So maybe we need to find a way of bringing different people together on this. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, this uh, brings us to the last presentation. Um, Charles, also about um, uh, acknowledgments in TCP. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez, and I'm going to present the document entitled Sender Control Related Acts in TCP, Problem Statement, Requirements, and Analysis of Potential Solutions. Uh, next, please. Well, uh, due to lack of time, perhaps uh, it's better to, to skip the status slide. So, next, please. Okay, so delayed acts is a mechanism intended to reduce protocol overhead. However, in some cases, delayed act may also be detrimental to performance. For example, when a segment carries a message of up to one MSS and the message is not elicited an application layer response, and a second data segment is not sent earlier than the delayed act timer, then the result is the act uh, gets necessarily delayed, which entails a number of negative consequences. And 
also a sender may want to override or restore use of delayed acts at the receiver. So in this document, we summarize, we present issues due to delayed acts. We derive a number of requirements for a potential solution. And in addition, uh, currently in the body of the document, we have a section on analysis of potential solutions based on the requirements. Next, please. About the issues due to delayed acts, we have identified issues in four main areas. The first is slow start, where congestion window grows by up to one sender MSS per every act that covers new data. Uh, the result is the delayed acts reduces number of acts received by the sender, then reducing the rate of congestion window growth and therefore uh, increasing transfer time, decreasing throughput. ABC might be a solution to this. It's already supported in several implementations. However, as mentioned before, well, it's not uh, yet, uh, well, not fully included in RFC 5681, it's experimental. And on the other hand, delayed acts also uh, precludes sender behaviors from fast non-intrusive capacity probing, such as chirping. Then the second area of issues is that of high bit rate environments and short segments are used. Uh, for example, sender that uses Nagel may be prevented from sending more data while waiting a delayed hack, leading to high in the performance as reported, for example, in the DNS Speedful Operations RFC, since in those environments, the RTT may be several orders of magnitude below the delayed act timer. Next, please. A third area of issues is IoT, where TCP is increasingly being used. Many IoT devices are significantly resource constrained, so uh, a sender uh, may not be able to release memory resources uh, after, until the corresponding ACK uh, to packet arrives. And this may be an issue for very constrained devices, eventually leading even up to packet drops. Also, many IoT devices are wireless and run on simple batteries, so a sender may need to stay with a radio interface enabled, which consumes energy until the corresponding act arrives. So if there's some delay with the act, then this may lead to increased energy consumption, decreased lifetime for the device. And also a delay might be exacerbated due to some uh, negative interactions between the acts and some uh, well, mechanisms available in some layer two technologies intended to save energy. Finally, a fourth area of issues is that we might want to enable act transmission behaviors beyond the, the traditional ones. For example, there's congestion control for acts in RFC 5690. And also there's uh, scenarios with path symmetric capacity where the arrival rate limits forward path performance and in some technologies, such as Doxys, mobile, cellular, and others, uh, well, this is kind of mitigated by applying act thinning, but then this is uh, out of the control of the TCP endpoints. Next, please. So uh, we have uh, derived a number of requirements for a potential solution to control delayed acts. The first is uh, that the sender well, the mechanism should be sender triggered or control because the assumption is the sender knows when delayed acts should be overridden. Then uh, we understand that the mechanism uh, should work at the persimmon granularity as uh, even within a connection, perhaps there's fixed traffic and for part of it, delayed acts work as intended and for the rest, maybe not. Also, the new mechanism should minimize header or message overhead and uh, it should also uh, have support to enable generic ratios. Next, please. Also, the new mechanism should have as good middle box traversal properties as possible, and it should allow a safe return to normal delayed acts operation. Also, it should minimize impact on existing or future TCP functionality. And uh, when this then we should avoid hacks uh, which may be suboptimal and have performance issues. And also we may want to consider who is in control since the uh, the receiver maybe cannot honor the behavior desired by the sender. And then there's a range of possibilities of what can happen uh, at that moment. So next please. Well, we have also collected a number of potential solutions that have been suggested since we started uh, working on this space. Uh, so the first is ACCC, where the sender uh, tells the, the receiver which is the ACK ratio to be used. 
actually see the users two new TCP options for that. And well, we may want to maybe take into account which is the, the impact of the overhead of that. And also middle box traversal of new TCP options is, is often regarded as bad. Then another uh, solution that was suggested is TLP, where uh, additional acts are uh, in, they're triggered uh, by sending a segment after the probe timeout, this may entail significant overhead. Also, there's our earlier ACPUL flag proposal, which incurs no overhead but uses preserved TCP header bits. Next, please. Another approach could be defining a new ACPUL option, having similar semantics as the ACPUL uh, flag. Also, another approach would be reusing existing TCP header fields. However, then the problem is that semantics may become overloaded. And finally, well, there are hacks which uh, entail some performance issues and also uh, cleanliness issues. So next, please. Well, we have summarized the solutions and uh, whether they satisfy, are, uh, satisfactorily address the requirements. And well, the main conclusion is that no ideal solution appears to exist at the moment. There's a number of trade-offs. So next, please. Well, we'd like to thank everyone who has given lots of feedback uh, all this time. And also we would like to ask the working group whether the document would be ready for working group adoption. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if, if you are considering your document, you would, what would be the intended status of that document? Well, uh, and then, well, this would be informational. Informational, okay. Um, there were questions. Gauri. Oh, thank you for another talk about ACTS. Uh, also interesting. Have you looked at RSC 7053 and the, um, the back pressure that was applied for doing the, the SCTP version of ACTS pull? Uh, well, uh, I haven't yet looked at the document, so well, uh, we'll definitely look at it. Okay. So, so well, I'm saying that because when that was put up, I was very much opposed to it, and there was one or two reasons why that document made a good RFC. The list of issues I saw in the first issues list, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe that these are real issues. I'd like to discuss those on the list. Um, because things vary, this, this, is, this is something I think that is dangerous to pursue. And I think we need to talk much more about it before we consider working group adoption. Okay. Okay, so thanks. And yeah, we'll bring this to further discussion to, to show which, uh, well, to what extent these are issues. Bob? If you are saying something right now, you're muted. That's a good point. It helps, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> it, it, it was me that um, originally suggested to Carlos that he turns his proposal for the ACPOL thing into a requirements document um, on the basis that so many people were saying, oh, I don't I like this mechanism. I prefer this one. And it was, no, oh, no, I prefer this one. What about this one? I thought, well, you know, we're never going to get through this. Why don't we um, do what? Carlos has started to do here, so I hope people um, uh, like the approach of trying to pull together everyone's ideas as to what we're trying to do before we try and solve the problem. Um, and, and that's what I particularly would like I, adopted by the working group, if you like, whether this draft itself is ready for adoption. Um, I, I personally think it's a good start, but I, um, but I would um, you know, agree that the discussion needs to go on in the working group as to what actually goes into this draft. But I, I think there's so much pressure to do this that we need an exercise to, to sort it out. That's all. Hey, Paul, I think... Okay. Um, any comments from someone else? I agree there is um, a lot of uh, to be done on the X, but I think I also want to second Gori that, you know, we need to, you know, um, there are like two drafts 
founders, right? And they are somewhat don't um, completely complement each other. So we should step back, look at the drafts in detail, and then discuss before we rush to adoption. So um, this is Richard. Oh, one last comment. Um, we have had the experience that uh, that this problem of delayed X under certain circumstances really is a major latency issue. And uh, so I'm more in the camp of having uh, the ability to do something about this would be good. Um, so I'm not saying that uh, that one or the other solution is, is, is better or proper, but I think we need to have the discussion. Michael Tripson, as an individual, um, I, I agree. We need the discussion um, on the mailing list. Since we have two minutes over time already. Um, but um, for Richard, if you say you have experienced this, um, it would be really great if you could provide some information about the scenario or the setup or whatever um, you are experiencing this. Can yeah, that's, what, that's what Scori is asking. What is Richard's use case? So Richard, are you going to answer that? Uh, yes, but on list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so this means with three minutes over time, we are done. Um, thank you, Charles. Thank you all for the, thank you to all the presenters and the people attending. Um, if you have anything to bring up, the chance is now. Going once. Going twice. Um, uh, then I would say, normally I would say, see you in whatever, but I'm not sure. So that's why. See you sometimes. Goodbye. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you thank to you. Richard for taking the notes. Michael and Yoshi, can you stay? Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, maybe I stop the recording right now? Yes, you can stop the recording.